Great. So we are, welcome everybody to, and I'm just glancing down because I, episode 55, and because we're not doing them once a week now, I, I keep forgetting what number it is. And actually someone sent me a message. I meant to tell you this, Craig. Someone sent me a message worried that we were going to grow apart because we're not doing these every week anymore. <laughs> right? I've, I've, uh, I've assured them that we talk, we talk almost daily anyway. So yeah, thank you so much to Sarah and Catherine for joining us, particularly so so early in the morning, like ridiculous o'clock. We really, really appreciate it. And we're going to be talking about uh, about ballet, about dance, but in particular about ballet, because this is where your two um, sort of special interests are. And I believe where you've both done or doing your PhDs in as well. So I've had so many questions come in. I'm not sure uh, exactly what logical orders to ask them in. So we're just going to work through them. And if anyone um, has got any questions as we're going along, fire them into the comments and Craig will pick up on them. Um, could we start? If, if it's okay, just talking a bit about your PhDs. Um, just tell us yeah. a bit about what you, yeah, a bit about what you did, and um, and how it's relevant to, the, yeah, what the sort of clinical translation is for people seeing dancers, things like, like that. Okay, well, I'll I'll start. So I finished my PhD last year. Um, mine was on uh, the sort of the foot in turnout in pre-professional dancers. So looking at the whole lower limb and foot using uh, 3D kinematics, so motion capture. And uh, what we found originally is that there's no uh, foot model designed uh, just for dancers. Because they move through such a huge range of motion, um, there are a lot of the assumptions that, you know, you get no movement in each segment kind of had to... We had to modify and make more segments because there was too much movement within... A normal segment that they've been using in dance so normally they've just been making a, a hind foot and just a forefoot which sort of was encompassing that midfoot um, so what we did was we decided to break it up and have a, a hind foot a midfoot and forefoot but also allowing us to measure the first um, MPJ movement um, in more of a clinical clinical way Yeah. Keep going, Sierra. I've just shared oh, okay. the screen with your paper. So, um, so I guess the, the most clinically relevant one would be the, the last um, article uh, that came out um, earlier this year. And what we found was that um, when we looked at using sort of more your static measurements that you'd use in, in clinic, um, we found that navicular drop was not predictive of the arch behaviour during dynamic movements. So during um, jumps, which are called sautés, um, when I first started doing dance research, I kept saying sauté, and all the dancers were like, no, 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 it's sauté. <laughs> um, so as long as you can pronounce that correctly, you'll be fine when, te when treating any dancers. Just don't say sauté. Yeah. Um, <laughs> their respect for you probably will drop. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what we did, so from that we looked at sort of the navicular movement in both the static position, so in turnout, uh, in both what their preferred turnout angle is and forced turnout. So this is when they're truly, really trying to exaggerate that turnout angle, and um, and then also looking at those those jumps and the behaviour of that midfoot just using a navicular marker. Um, and we found that you're better off looking at what they're actually doing dynamically. Um, because all dancers are trained to try and have a high arch. So when they're doing in their static position, they're really controlling lifting up that arch. But that static control doesn't really necessarily mean it's going to translate to what's happening dynamically, particularly with jump landings, um, because if, if they've got a weakness in any of those muscles, that sort of navicular drop, that midfoot drop, is going to be really exaggerated when they're landing on those jumps. And they're doing about 200 jumps per class. So the amount of impact that that has on the joints is, is quite, quite a lot when they're doing, if they're doing a class every day. Um, and some classes can be two hours. Um, and the dancers that I uh, looked at were pre-professional dancers within a um, sort of a tertiary college, which is associated with a university. So they were doing um, dance rehearsals, dance classes, and then also doing some units. Um, on nutrition and a little bit of biomechanics um, and sort of dance history as well at the same time. So we had a really good um, group of girls who were all had similar um, dance characteristics, similar um, dance sort of 
history and uh, the current dancing level that they're at. So we've got a really good succinct sort of idea of what at that level, um, what kind, how the foot was behaving. Now, when you get your professional dancers, this is where a further culling happens. <laughs> so the dancers that maybe don't have the best um, technique, maybe don't have those perfect ranges of motion, maybe they've got an ongoing um, injury at a pre-professional level, they're not going to make it into a company, not few dancers make it into a company. Um, and also depends on the size of the dancer. Your shorter dancers who have very fair skin are more likely to get into companies in Asia. Um, your dancers that have that perfect sort of that Russian method of turnout so you're basically your flat turnout with perfect alignment. So they've got the, the perfect sort of anatomy. They're going to be pretty sort of picked up by your more um, sort of Eastern Europe um, companies. They're going to be looking for those. Um, dancers that are generally probably a bit not as slender as your traditional idea of what you think a ballet dancer should look like are more likely going to be in your like Australian, UK, American companies. Um, so different companies and different, in different countries have what they consider them nice ideal kind of look of a dancer so yeah if you don't have the right look then maybe you won't get into a company um but i feel like i've really deviated from that question ian i kind of remember what the question was i just got a complete <laughs> <tag>. <laughs> it's good it's good we're just here to talk we're just here to talk dance you just go for it you just go yeah, wherever it I, takes I can us. talk for um, hours and yeah what the question was um, I definitely, I, I definitely want to come back in a second to talking about the, the amount of load they do, the amount of jumps they do per class, and then we'll we'll build on that and talk a bit about how you know just how much how much a ballet company is asking of them. Because I, I don't know, the first time I met a, a ballet dancer from a Royal Ballet School in London, I just couldn't believe the, the six days a week volume that they were doing. So we'll come to that. Question was about PhD. So could we yes. could we just quickly ask? Can we just quickly ask Kat, because you just, are you, you've, you're midway through your PhD or you're just starting it, are you, Kat? I'm just starting it this year. Um, yeah. We've come up with our template and uh, going through our proposal and everything at the moment. So what we're um, sort of hoping to look at is injury prevention in point shoe dancers. Uh, so once the girls um, transfer to point, uh, what can we do for injury prevention and, and whatnot? And we're going to be correlating a couple of different outcomes with radiographic measures, um, along with some clinical measurements and some outcomes as well, um, which also, again, touch on the pre-point assessments, um, which we were just chatting about earlier. Um, so some, some of those measurements sort of come into, come into our, um, our scope there. Mm. Now, Catherine, I understand you come from quite a dance background, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. I have all my shoes here today. Well, some of my very well, old well, Look shoes. at those, yeah. Um, <laughs> so what, what did you used to do dance-wise? I used to do point, ballet, tap, jazz. Um, I did a little bit of Irish dancing for a while, but that, that sort of wrecked havoc on me a little. So that one got dropped fairly quickly. Um, That's a I, I, more, more, more than ballet, more so than ballet. <laughs> Um, yes, I suppose it did because in Irish dancing and Highland dancing and you know all those other sort of Celtic type dancings, there's a huge amount of jumping that has to happen, um, and and that that just wasn't something that um, my joints could keep up with. I could rather do point because once you're up on point, it's a lot less strenuous to stay up there. Yeah, are you, are you, are you still doing any point dancing, or can't you do it anymore? No, no, I don't do it anymore. No. <laughs> um, I do a little bit, well, I'm getting back into doing a little bit of um, classical ballet. Um, I'm not quite back at point level yet, no. <laughs> um, we, we've had some questions that have come in about going on point, and we've had the, the, the expected questions about children and when they start and when they should go on point, and you've kind of touched already on like a, like a, like a point assessment. I guess that's a bit like what we do in football like a like a an injury screening or something um the, let, let, let's start with children I, the reason being i'm guessing that the majority of people that get into ballet i might be wrong call me on it if i am but the majority of people that get into ballet are doing so when they're very young young boys young girls um what age do they start what age should they start and and that classic question that i'll just throw out there and you can do with whatever you want but it is ballet is ballet bad feet? <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know. Catherine, do you take this for a bit and then I'll take over? Or? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, typically people will, um, people will start um, going on to point so anywhere between the ages of 8 and 12. Um, a lot of dance schools and teachers will be very aware of the children's growth and their bone growth. And will, a lot of them put this arbitrary sort of 13 years of age number onto the students and say, look, when you're 12, or you're almost 13, we can put you on to point. Um, so that's, that's also something that we potentially wanted to touch on um, with our research, but I think we're moving uh, more into injury prevention, as it turns out that a lot of the time when the students are ready for point, it's more of a functional and dynamic assessment of the student because the students are most likely to be on point during their years of massive growth through their, you know, um, prepubescent and adolescent sort of years. They're doing an, an enormous amount of bone growth and therefore muscular growth. And it's, it's more important rather to keep them um, sort of stronger, um, um, make sure that they're doing resistance training and whatnot to maximize their ability to stay on point and whatnot. Um, there's not necessarily an age number um, that's most ideal for all students. Um, Actually, Catherine, can I, can I just ask, I've, I've seen a number of times now that you should never go on to point unless you're going to go on to a professional career. How, how right. would you respond to that? Um, <laughs> I mean, there's probably some, probably some truth in that. There's probably not a huge amount of reason to go up onto point if you're not planning on going professionally. But I mean, who, who at 12 years old and who loves ballet doesn't want to be a ballet dancer for life? I mean, I did. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I got real. Yeah, and, and I think it's sort of something that they aspire to is going on point. The, the beauty yeah. of wearing these point shoes and the right. satin lace and tying them. And, and also you've always seen all the older dancers sort of fiddle with their shoes and modify them. And so they're sort of like, yeah, like Catherine said, at 12, you, you're not thinking about it as a career. You're just doing it for the love of it, really. Yeah. Um, I think that putting, making children at that age decide are they going to be doing this for life? That's a, that's, I think that's unrealistic. I don't think, I mean, you look at other careers, you're not asking them at 12, do you want to become a professional footballer? I mean, maybe you are, or, you know, or maybe, but really you don't start doing that stuff until you're, like, you're 15, 14 even, yeah. you know, 16 when you're at school, you're trying to work out, oh, do I want to do, you know, university? Or oh, am I wanting to go into more a career as a sports player? At 12, you're not thinking that. You're not mm. thinking uni. <laughs> you're not thinking career, other careers. You're just doing like, it's like asking a kid, oh, what do you want to be? And they're like, I want to be an astronaut. They're not thinking about how you become an astronaut. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. yeah. Actually, my, my experience or my limited experience with dance teachers is they're actually quite smart about yeah. those kinds of issues. They're actually very knowledgeable. <laughs> Um, yeah. I've, I've always been quite impressed in my interaction with them and just how much they do know about the issues surrounding going on point or not at what stage. So mm -hmm. I, I would defer to their expertise in my case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they've seen so many students coming through and also they understand body movement so much more than some even sports scientists because you have to be in tune with so many things that are going on um, that you know, we do ask them, you know, their opinion when we are doing a pre-point assessment. I mean, we're looking more of the anatomy, we're looking more at our clinical tests, our clinical reasoning and working out those risk factors. But then also the dance teachers, they're looking in that classroom and they can see the one dancer who isn't performing the same as everyone else, the one dancer who's fatiguing more in class, they're not going to allow that dancer to go on point yet. Yeah. So they're, they're, that's how they're doing their assessment. They're comparing it to where they see compared to all the other dancers within the class. Same thing at school when you've got the school teacher and they're seeing all the kids running in the play field. They're going to see the one de kid that's got that odd gait, that odd running style. So it's just sort of that same, same thing with dance teachers. They're going to notice something that's odd or different. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but so what was your... Sorry, what was that Ian? Sorry, no, I was just, just thinking ahead. What would your response be to, in, in clinic, uh, a parent who's got concerns and worries about their daughter or their son 
doing ballet because of their age. Perhaps they're younger than 12. Perhaps they're thinking about getting started. Um, and I've certainly spoken to parents that, that have seen Darcy Bustle's feet in, in, in a magazine and just how battered that they were. And, and uh, they just worry that, about their children doing it. What would your retort be? Um, I think at the end of the day, it's the, the children are the main driver. If they, they want to do it, you know, they're going to do it. Um, whether they might resent you and then later in life pick it up. Uh, but um, I think if you dance within your um, functional ability and your range of motion, um, then you're really going to be quite safe doing dance. It's when dancers push their body beyond their limits. Um, it's when they're trying to get that ideal aesthetic look, but to get there, they're compensating through their body. Um, and also maybe they're doing too much too soon. Um, maybe their motor development um, is a bit delayed. That's why we've always got to assess those things um, because that's when they're going to get most injuries in the, is at that pre-pubescent stage and also puberty. This is where they get a lot of their injuries because things are growing and changing. Um, and also the, the child's constantly trying to improve themselves. Um, I would say that most, most dancers or young dancers, they will get injured. That might be when they stop dancing. Um, I think that any kind of physical activity, you should encourage it. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of times these days, people are just, kids are just not moving at all. Um, so I think that it is as a social aspect and I think that, you know, if, if they're only doing it once or twice a week and it's, they're not on point, they're just doing it for the fun of it, then that's great. Um, but, yeah, if they're, if they're doing it nine times a week, they're getting the stress fractures, I would be thinking, okay, we're going to have to make some modifications here um, because clearly your body's not coping with it. Or it might be that dance is one of the things that they're doing. But they're doing all these other forms of exercise and you say, What's your most favourite form of exercise that you do? Okay, we're going to probably just, you're going to have to drop something. Something's going to have to drop because your body can't cope with that. So, um, yeah, most of the time I haven't really had pushy parents, to be honest. It's more the kids have been incredibly focused. I find your classical dancers are very focused because that's how the dance class is. Everyone's yeah. very focused and very serious. You go to modern dancers or like tap, they're all a bit wacky, a bit more crazy. <laughs> when I was um, at WAPA, which is the WA Institute, well, WA Academy of Performing Arts, your ballet dancers were, the, were a completely different personality to any of the other dancers there. Mm -hmm. They're all a bit more artistic, a little bit more like artsy fighty with their clothes and stuff, whereas the ballet dance is very prim and proper, very different personality. <laughs> <laughs> So that was one of the biggest things I noticed. I was like, "Wow, okay, you can tell when a ballet dancer comes through compared to when like it's a modern dancer or, or yeah, it's very, very different personality. So ballet dancers tend to be very, very driven, um, very motivated and have a very high patient compliance too because they yeah. want to get well. They're used to being told what to do and, and, to, and to follow through it. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Sorry about my internet tonight, guys. I've no idea what's going on. Um, it's just messing around. Um, can we talk a bit more about the point uh, assessment? Yep, yep, yep. And what, um, that, what that entails? So a lot of the standard tests that you do for any sort of biomechanical assessment, the differences are is that you're looking for endurance and stability of the ankle joint. So endurance, you're really looking to see, you know, can they maintain... Um, you know, prevent fatigue during class. Most, most dance injuries actually happening during class and rehearsals from fatigue, not so much from performance. Yes. So it's, it's looking at whether they can actually, um, you know, if they've got good calf endurance. Most, um, I know the Australian um, uh, at ballet, they will do 35 calf raises every day okay. on one leg and that's in addition to everything else they do. Yeah to keep that calf endurance up. Um, I think that's now been encouraged in some other football sports as well, um, because looking at the reduced risk of injury um, when you're doing those calf endurance exercises. So with a three-point assessment, we're wanting to um, see whether they can do 25 um, single leg hill raises 
Now it's really important that they aren't doing it after class because they're already fatigued. Yes. <laughs> they don't have to do the assessment on the day that they're not doing class. Yes. Or in the um, morning. Yeah. yeah, they will fail all of your tests because yeah. they're already fatigued. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're wanting to get a good um, pre-point assessment or even just a, a screening assessment, um, the Harkness um, Centre for Injuries, they actually have um, a sort of a pre-season assessment form which you can use um, in your uh, screenings of your dancers. And it really is quite comprehensive, isn't it? Yeah, very, very comprehensive, yeah. So it's yeah. looking at neuromuscular control, range of motion, um, and then like Sarah said, endurance and whatnot. Um, so it does give you a really great picture of the student, but then again, it is a snapshot of that student at only that time, um, which means to say that they could obviously sustain some sort of injury during, doing something completely different and therefore in a few weeks' time potentially not be eligible for point work um, considering the nearest injury. Um, so that I suppose that is one of the limitations of it, but it is just a snapshot. Snapshot. Mm. Yeah. So a lot of the times, it's good to do a pre-assessment at the beginning of when they go on point, and then assess after they've gone on point to see how things have changed. Yeah. Um, rather just having a one-off snapshot, it's it's great for that one-off time, but then you've got all this base data that you can use to see how the dance is progressing over time and see, has anything changed? Um, have they improved in something? Is something weakened? Because um, when they do go on point, they actually start to get less calf endurance. That's um, exactly right. Oh. So, yeah, it starts to deteriorate. And also, um, the older dancers tend to have less dorsiflexion range of motion as well. Um, and that has um, impact on their, on their jump landings. Um, so it is important to actually, rather than just seeing the podiatrist once for a three-point assessment, it's really good to see well, how are they now they're on point? You know, are they getting any blisters now? Are they getting any corns? Are they getting any callus? Um, are their toes getting you know, squished in the shoes? Are they wearing the right point shoes? Do we need to think about changing the type of point shoes that they're wearing? Um, so it is, it's good to follow up. I think that a lot of people, a lot, I don't know whether in the dance community, but or maybe dancers think you just needed one assessment. It's good to continue on and follow that dancer through their life because you have all this baseline data um, that otherwise would go to waste if you didn't see them again to follow up on everything. Exactly. And um, it, sometimes it gets recommended that once you've started putting uh, new students onto point that um, you follow up by doing every now and then with in classes, taking off the point shoe and ensuring that the toes are pointing correctly and that they're not, you know, clawing while they're in the shoe to try and, you know, maintain that arch I'm just going to pull out uh, a prop. <laughs> like I said, I've got all my old shoes here. So the classic shoes that are in training mm -hmm. and whatnot has, has a split sole, which means that when the girls and, and the boys point, they get really lovely arches in class. And then typically with your point shoe, it doesn't have a split sole. So to get a really nice point and arch, it's going to require a lot more uh, force and control. Um, now we'll talk about we can talk about point shoes whenever you like because there's so many different <laughs> factors, but um, it it is obviously important to make sure that they're they're pointing their toes properly when they're in point shoes. So yeah. that's that's sort of what we look at there. Yeah, actually, just before you, we, I, we'll come back to shoe in a moment. But just while we were talking, I've I've just googled. Uh, let me share my screen. I just googled pre point assessment. Just curious, mm -hmm. and you know, it's really quite interesting that there's a lot of clinics, podiatry and physio clinics offering it. Now these, these are obviously local to Melbourne results here, but I just thought it was really interesting, lots of um, clinics offering these pre-point assessment, even to the extent where this Google Local has brought up some podiatry clinics, which mm. I think is quite interesting. But yeah, as you scroll down, you see um, there's physios, podiatry clinics, ballet places. So my question really based on that is, is how standardized is it? How formal is this pre-point assessment process? Um, not at all. There's been, there's no current, um, protocol for it. One of the most research articles that came out, I think it was two years ago in ballet was pre-point assessments. There is no standardized process at all. Um, no one has done a big systematic review on it. There's probably, 
you probably couldn't do that because there's probably not enough research on it. Um, really, a lot of the assessment stuff does come out of um, with your endurance and, and um, your dynamic stuff. That's more coming from your sports scientists. So they're the ones who are doing a lot of looking how at other tests that you use in other sports. Does that translate to ballet? Can you use those assessments in ballet? Um, like the star excursion test is only probably one of the one few ones that they do use. They do translate that into ballet um, in their pre-point assessments. But yeah, there hasn't been much research done on it. So who knows what anyone's actually including in it um, in their pre-point assessments. Um, it's certainly, a, I think whoever does a research study on it, it would be a massive project to do. Mm -hmm. um, you'd yeah, get a, you know, a lot of interest in I, I suspect that's a bit of a concern that it's not standardized. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, just I've got to, I'm just bringing up something. I've just, I've just, I'm, hang on, just give me a moment. So I'm just trying to load something. I just, All right. did, so, I mean, that's sort of why, why I sort of always look towards at the Harkness Center of Injuries because they do look, they, they do do some research and they do do some. Um, oh, so yeah, she, Carly was um, from Adelaide. She presented this last year. Um, yeah, no, I just saw this, but I, I, I just wanted to, I just did notice this, it was only a few weeks ago, I think this came out, but it was um, this last sentence yeah. here, as such, there is clear need for further study of pre-point screening. <laughs> you know, they, yes. they pretty much come to that conclusion that, that you just, just mentioned, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. And she's planning on doing her PhD. Um, mm. She's trying to get her proposal together at the moment. I don't know if she's doing it in dance. Oh, okay. well, I was trying to convince her to do it in dance, but in Perth, I was like, oh, come over to Perth. We'll do a PhD here. Perth is not that far from Adelaide. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if she's, um, I think she's sort of thinking Perth's probably a bit more isolated than Adelaide is. So <laughs> perhaps, I'm not sure. But yeah, I should touch base with her um, soon to find out if she's actually doing her PhD on, on dance. Yeah, because if she is and doing a pre point assessment, that's going to be some really interesting research that comes out there. Actually, yeah. just, just while we're talking, I've, I've just come across this one, quantitative measures. And I remember reading this uh, a wee while ago, and I thought this was funny. There's all these tests, the airplane test. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, that I'd never heard of before. And there's the heel, heel raise endurance test. So, you know, yeah, I mean, there are obviously people are looking at it, but I, again, I, 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 it does concern me somewhat, especially after that Google search, the mm. university that seems to be um, available or being offered is to do that in, in that screening process. Yeah, 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 I know. It's, um, it, is, it is worrying. Um, and that's the thing is we always try and look at the, what the research is coming out, but there isn't a huge amount coming from a podiatry perspective. Most of the pre-point assessments research done is looking at the ankle and the ankle stability and the endurance of the muscles around the ankle. A lot of research is done on the hip, heaps of research on the hip, um, and a little bit on the knee. Hardly anything on the foot. If it is in the foot, it's mainly in the sagittal plane. Um, no one's really looking at any, other, uh, any of the other planes um, when they are you know, working out how the foot moves. Um, so that is definitely something that needs to be done. Um, there was very low quality research done a while ago. Um, and, and it was looking at hyperpronation and dances. Um, no, some other, and, um, yeah, even I didn't bother citing it in my thesis because although this is not even, I can't, this is terrible. Um, <laughs> So there isn't, there isn't much to be done that has been done previously. Um, so it was a great area for me to do because I had a clean slate. I didn't have to really go whatever way I wanted to go. Um, but yeah, it's certainly something that more research needs to be done in dance. And really it is, it is our area or our scope of, of treatment. It's the foot. The foot is their main instrument in, in dance or in, you know, it's, it's, it's essential. So I think we really do need to understand how the foot moves. Um, how best to assess that um, and even one of our, our third year projects at the moment they're doing um, assessment looking at the first met head shape using fluoroscopy um, and seeing how that affects um, if they have increased risk of um, sort of abduction of the hallux when they are going to force turnout so we're looking at that association and this is in pre-point students so we're not looking that they're going on point yet 
we're just looking at to see if does the met head shape influence their ability um, or influence them developing more hallux valgus later in life because a lot of people they will think oh, i go on point or i i will develop bunions not every dancer does develop bunions but um, the number of bunions in dancers is a higher percentage compared to the normal population. Whether it's the hypermobility involved, we don't know, that's another factor we're looking at. Um, but yeah, perhaps um, the met head shape is another reason why. Yeah, because uh, the met head shape is a, a factor that you take into account with a lot of people that get reoccurrence of bunions post-surgery. Um, so we had to look at that sort of research and found that um, people that have a, um, like the lateral side is um, sort of lower than the medial side, that med head is able to more glide over laterally. Um, and that's been a risk factor for recurrence of bunions in just the general population after surgery. So we're having a look as do dancers, um, is that one of the factors that could be, you know, anatomical variation that increases the risk of, of bunions as later in life? Because um, that was uh, through my um, research using looking at turnout and also force turnout using that uh, foot model, we did look at the abduction angle and there was no association between that abduction angle and any of the other variables within the foot. Um, so in some dancers, their abduction angle actually reduced when they went into forced turnout, which kind of defeats what you'd normally think the foot does in forced turnout. Yeah. Um, and I know my angle, um, my hallux abduction angle actually reduces when I go into forced turnout because I'm gripping the ground, my arch is increasing in height, and basically I'm going into more supinated position um, when I'm in forced turnout. But that's, um, that's just how my foot is, but everyone's foot behaves differently. So predicting of, you know, it's always good to get a dance in forced turnout and see what happens you know, what is the, is the foot, is the foot pronating much? Is it, if it's not pronating much at all, where are they getting that forced turnout? Is it coming from the knee? Is that a lot of knee laxity? Um, and that's going to sort of help you work out, okay, well, maybe potential injuries. They might have some issues with the knee because of the, um, you know, constant stretching of those medial ligaments and things like that. So really you have to sort of, there's not a standard protocol with um, working out, how a dancer compensates. They compensate with what their, what their movement availability is at each joint. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, there was a, uh, I know you <coughs> sort of had this question in, but it sort of comes up that this whole point of pre-point assessment raises the issue of potential harm to the foot in ballet. So the, I think the sort of the question, I think we, I think you had there somewhere, it's just, is it good for you? Is it harmful to the foot? Which is why the, the pre-point assessment is so in screening so crucial so what's the harm <laughs> or what's the damage done? I, think, I think the the harm so the with pre-point assessments you're just working out what there are any red flags you're looking at red flags really um that would sort of say okay your foot's not appropriate for dance um or maybe red flags that okay we're going to have to monitor this area because maybe you've got a, an ossicle at you know the posterior ankle that potentially could get impinged or um, perhaps not all the bones are fused maybe you've got a tarsal coalition that's been misdiagnosed um, maybe you've, you know there's lots of lots of things that you're looking for but you you are looking for those red flags um, you are sort of making sure that you've got that baseline data and also a lot of it's to do around the stability aspect and the endurance aspect with point because if you can't get up to point and maintain that position then you're going to fatigue early in class and you're more likely to sprain an ankle really um, so um, a lot of the times the x-rays are pretty much just looking for ossicles accessory bones and it's best to take the x-rays with them in point and also in demi plie um, or grand plie, where you're getting that maximum dorsiflexion um, to see, you know, uh, you know, are they contacting any bone there um, to really know what their their limit or their range of motion is available. Yeah. Okay. Oh, ha how about you show us those shoes, Catherine? Tell us about okay. them. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you all about them. Um, so basically, the main features are that we've got 
the vamp and the toe box here. So it's how far it comes up and how high the box comes up as well. We've got um, obviously the heel cup here, this particular design, um, the shank ends at about, you know, a little shy of the heel, which means that the actual heel of the shoe, obviously it's very worn. Um, it hugs the heel quite well. Um, and it won't be as saggy at the back. And that's something sometimes that these designs are quite, quite um, oh. popular for. Um, anyway, so this, this is, I suppose, is the major um, area of concern. This being your platform, you can have square platforms, oval platforms, variety of shapes, um, and also the width of the shoe. So when you're fitting point shoes, it depends on the length of your toes, the width of your mesh tarsal region, the shape of your foot, whether it tapers back into a, a narrow heel or whether it's sort of more rectangular shaped. Um, a lot of different companies, um, you know, there's, there's the major Block, Grishko, uh, Freed, um, oh, what else have we got? Um, Gain or Midden, Capizio, things like that. They're the sort of the, the big shots in the point shoe making world. Um, and they all have slightly different designs and slightly different um, bits and pieces that they put into their shoe and, and how they create their shoe um, and what kind of lasts they create the shoes on, um, which make them all a little bit different. So um, let's say that this one, this one has a slightly shorter vamp than oh, this one. Yeah, and it's... Um, slightly tapered in its sort of width here so it's more triangular and one of these old bad boys which are much more square <laughs> and so this would be for um the you know egyptian or greek style foot where the first toe is the longest or the second and the first are almost the same size and the rest drop down whereas this would probably better be better for more celtic type toe or foot or you know, square foot. So, you know, that's a, a very basic way of looking at point shoes and how how just your foot shape will affect the shoe that you buy. Um, in terms of offloading as well, we um, I never had this back in my day, um, but uh, we created a little auto form device um, for my foot in one of my old point shoes just the um, just the other day. So as you can see, this is the shape of the shoe. My foot tends to go like this direction. I've got my big toe here, my fifth toe here, which means that there is a massive gap and there's a massive space inside the shoe, which would allow me to sickle more should my foot slip down. They might have to know what sickle is. Oh, a sickle? So <laughs> sickle is essentially when you're utilizing your tib post too much and um, your foot's um, sort of going in a four foot virus. Um, a fourth four foot virus to try and get a really nice point and line. Um, anyway, so that, that could potentially happen. Um, so uh, a way to mitigate that, I suppose, is to create an autoform device to fill in that space. And in essence, it will flatten out and equal the area at the top of the toes there while it's in the shoe. So, you know, something like this, something like sheep's wool, um, the dancers also wear pads made of a variety of different silicon type things, which, which are always great. Uh, they do slip and slide everywhere and they're not personalized. So I found that even just playing around with this, it was quite useful today because obviously it's quite lightweight and it doesn't take um, too much to squish it into the shoe there. And the girl, um, so mostly it's girls on point and they'll be quite used to doing a variety of things to their shoes and their feet to try and get point shoes to work for them. Um, another one of the things that I was gonna quickly touch on is that on the platform of the point shoe, so the bit that you stand on, there's a variety of ways to stop you from slipping because the shoe is typically made out of a really shiny, slippery satin that um, on this pair, you can see that rubber has been attached um, to stop you from slipping. My very, very old first pair, oh, where are they? My poor mother and I darned them <laughs> painstakingly. Um, 
So that, that a lot of care was taken on the first one. Sometimes people burn them. Um, these ones also got dunked in buckets of chamomile lotion to stop them being so slippery. Um, so, I mean, that just follows through onto a, another whole conversation about what dancers do to their shoes to make them oh, personalized for them. Actually, Catherine, I was just actually going to make that comment when I, when, you know, my, the stereotype of, of a dancer in their shoes is they, they seem to be extraordinarily innovative. In, the, yeah. in what they do um let me just can i just let me just share the screen again um yeah. when ian put this little promo together he used this image here yeah. of, the, of the of the foot and and you, you see this in similar images all over the place with mm -hmm. um, all sorts of corn pads and strapping and and you sort of get the impression that that's your stereotype of what we think of dancers how how much is that image based in reality it really is quite true, Sarah. It really is. Absolutely. And they try, they use stuff from, I think I've seen some of you use like, um, like Kleenex wipes and even like wrap them around their toes. Like yeah. they'll try whatever they've got and they learn a lot of it from the older dancers in the company. Mm -hmm. They'll see the older dancers preparing the shoe because um, they go through them incredibly quickly. In a performance, they'll they'll have two. They'll go through two point shoes. You three, um, yeah. yeah, and they can die pretty quickly. And when a point, a dead point shoe, um, basically you, it's you're going to get hyperextension. Um, so you be hyper hyper plantar flexing that ankle, and also then you're also um, you know plantar flexing through the midfoot more than you should be. Um, and so that has massive impact. So dancing on a dead shoe is also really bad. So working out when that when you have that dead shoe. Um, but yeah, a lot of dancers and they'll have different shoes for different performances where they're doing a lot of jumps or maybe they're doing a lot of turns. They'll have a different shoe for that and they'll mm -hmm. modify it slightly. They'll shave bits off. They will like like Catherine said, dunk things on chamomile. They'll paint the inside with glue to make it last longer. Um, they'll hammer the, the point, like the block, trying to soften up all, all the material there. Um, yeah. yeah, it's insane. Every dance does something completely different. And you're like, you're wondering like, how and why? But it, they've just, years and years of practice, they've sort of, that That's worked for them. Yeah. 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 Actually, I've just had a quick question. What, what's the point shoe cost in terms of dollars? Or it's about sixty dollars. So, so sixty Australian year. dollars. That's about twenty-five pounds. I think your dollars in is it? Yen's pounds. Pounds. <laughs> so sixty Australian dollars. <laughs> so, so yeah, somewhere in the region. Sometimes you can get them on sale for even cheaper, but that that wouldn't be ideal most of the time because once you pick a, a shoe and a style that suits, you have to go through a few. So I've got a few here. Um, then, then you typically want to stay with your own brand and your own style, but they can be upwards of a hundred and something dollars as well. Mm. So did yeah. you have some questions on load or something in? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it kind of feeds into the injuries that are seen the most. Uh, a valid question that came in is, is, is this assumption that all the injuries are stress and overuse type injuries valid? And then that fed into just how much load these, these dancers are doing um and and how we how we how do we address that if we're attached to a company or we're seeing ballet dancers as the treating clinician mm -hmm. they're resistant to think they're re resistant to things in their shoes which is our main weapon when we're trying to modify load if we can't do that we modify what they're actually volume of what they're doing they're not going to probably do that so i mean uh, oh, no, the you, can. you, you can you oh, can yeah. you can write the form out there are forms you can use to give to right. the dancer take to the dance teacher to say, look, I'm not allowed to do any grand plies for a week or two weeks. I have to reduce the number of jumps that I do in class. So the worst thing you can say to a dancer is you can't dance this week. Um, even if they're in a moon boot, you get them to do, you get them to still be in class and they dance with a moon boot on one leg. And it might be they're doing stuff on a bar. So instead of doing centre work, so in the middle of, of um, the dance room, they'll just do stuff on, on bar and they'll work on their abdominal strength and they'll work on um, their balance on the other leg. And Because any if they take a week out, that is so much deterioration that they'll probably more likely get another injury or something else um, mm. because they've had that deterioration. So you do have to modify. It might be that, okay, you're just going to have to do all of your movements in the pool with your hand on the edge of the pool 
and mm-hmm. doing, you know, doing some movements there so you're not loading through the foot. So you do have to modify what they're doing. But the worst, the dance teachers will not listen to you if they just say you can't dance for a week. Mm. But you're going to have to give them something. You're going to have to give them something to work with. And it might be okay. And they're happy to modify stuff in class. Mm. But the worst thing is to bring, take that student out of the dance class. Yeah. So the um, tip is keep them, keep them dancing, but, but mm-hmm. tweak their, yeah. their volume. And, and what yeah. about I- interventions? Tape is the lion's share of what we're doing, or, or where do all foces fit into this? Clearly not in point shoes, but when they're away from those shoes. Yeah, it's pretty much when they're away from other shoes and, and you know, during... Um, it, it depends on what age they're at. If they're school, you're working with the school shoes. Um, if they're more adult, you know, adult classes or dancers, then you don't, they're not in shoes as often. Um, so it is sort of taping and things like that. Um, and they're not going to, you're going to have to use skin colored tape. They're not going to want bright, colorful tape. Um, <laughs> I did watch a video once where they, they put on white tape and then they use like, I think, camomile lotion to dye it a skin color. So you couldn't see the tape when they were wearing their point shoes during performance because obviously that's not great aesthetics. So, um, yeah, it it might be that, yeah, using your skin-coloured tapes. Um, But often you don't want to keep using them because it's going to cause them further skin deterioration as well um, with all the adhesives and things like that. Um, But, yeah, it's, it's trialling everything that you've got. You've got to have a big arsenal of things. And you've got to let the dancer know that this is this is plan A. We've got plan B, C, and D. If that doesn't work, then come back in. We'll try something else. Because if you don't tell them that you've got other options, they're not probably going to come back. They're probably going to think, oh, that's that's all they can do. I'll try someone else. Mm-hmm. I mean, in terms of injury, um, I've got some numbers, and a good, like, over 85% of injuries to dancers tends to be in the lower leg. And the mm-hmm sort of the three major things that occur are tendonitis, strains, and um, what was it? And and sprains, that's right. So um, treating them would be just, just the same way that you would treat them in any other population, but just being a lot more aware of their activity and um, the amount of exercise required of them. Mm. Actually, here's a question. How, how many cases of plantar fasciitis have you seen in dancers? Does it happen? Um, not really. Not really, yeah. no. Um, like you said before, Ian, a lot of injuries can be overuse. And like Sarah said before also is that a lot of their injuries will happen in class and in rehearsals rather than during a performance. So when they're doing a lot of repetitive work for a number of hours over and over. And um, where was I going with that question? Sarah, I've got your bug. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no. See, this is what happens at four o'clock in the morning, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you just got to turn. It's like you're just going autopilot, and you're like, "Where yeah. am I going with this again?" <laughs> oh, injury. Um, well, I've yeah. got another question. If if you want me to pitch in, and you if yeah. you think of it, just just okay. interrupt me. It, it came from a da- It came from a dancer whose whose name is George. Hello, George, if you're watching. He gave, he, uh, our, our podiatry colleague, Diane, knew that this was going on. She was talking to, I think, one of her patients, who is George's mum. So that's a kind of three degree <laughs> separation. And George had a couple of questions that he wanted to, uh, me to ask you, if that's okay. And give, being a, a, a male dancer, I don't, and forgive me, I don't know his age. I get the impression he, he might be in bed rather than watching this. But um, yeah. uh, male, ma- the different demands of the male dancer and the female dancer, the two that come to mind is, as we've already touched on, that females tend to go more on point than, than males. And obviously males have more um, of a lifting role, uh, to, to my understanding. Um, and his question was, obviously, are the, injury, are the injuries between male and female different? Are they managed differently? And from his perspective as a dancer, the preventative work you do, the, you know, the way you keep yourself in, in good condition, would that be different between uh, male and female? Um, there's definitely a big difference between injuries. I mean, with your male dancers, it's a lot of lower back injuries. Um, they do get a lot of ankle injuries, but you don't tend to see so many of the toe ones. It's more, it's, the biggest one is the, is the back. The back is really the one that ends their, their career often as a male dancer because you're just 
can't lift them up anymore. And so what you'll find is you'll see the older, da- older male dancers in the company. Um, they won't be doing any of the lifting. They'll be doing some of the, you know, the holding the dance when they're doing the pirouettes or something like that, but they won't be doing any more lifting because it's just, their body just can't cope with that anymore through the back. Um, mm-hmm. With the male dancers, like particularly if, if they have got even a foot injury, just preventing them from doing lifting in, in rehearsals or practice or class is a good way to reduce that load. Um, because if you're carrying someone else all the time, the load through your foot is even more. Um, they do do a lot more larger jumps as well, the, da- the male dancers, um, compared to your, your female dancers. And they are, I mean, the female, traditionally female dancers aren't doing, I mean, they do do um, little jumps, but they're, they're not doing your big, huge jumps that the, the male dancers are doing. And it is, um, so trying to reduce the jump that, that males are doing is a big thing as well, if they're trying to sort of reduce their load. Um, but yeah, it, it's, they are, they're different. There's often very few male dancers in the company. So, um, they, it's interesting that characteristics of the males that I've dealt with, you can get the really, or well, I had this one male and he, he loved to show off how flexible he was. So he'd always in class, he'd always be stretching heaps and you just look at the other male dancers and they'll be like, what? But I think, the, I think that male dancer was probably stretching too much and may not have had the strength at the end of range of motion to maintain that flexibility or may, you know, prevent himself from getting an injury. So that's another thing is that they really have to be strong at those end ranges of motion. So a lot of it is strength with the men. Um, they need to be really, really strong um, because they are lifting, um, but also they have to do a lot more stretching than the female dancers do, just genetic wise. Um, so they have to do a lot more um, dynamic stretching and things like that and a lot more um, core stability um, and upper back strength because of the lifting of the dancers um, as well. I don't know if that answers your question. But, yeah, um, so basically, so George needs to stay flexible, he needs to stay strong, he needs to basically do everything he can to, to protect his back and have a strong back. Absolutely, back. yeah, and he'll be fine, yeah. Um, second question from George, but well, it's actually from George's mum, and it's about the maintenance of, of callus and hard skin on the feet, which we've already touched on is, is a really yeah. a big deal. We've seen some of the modifications that dancers make and the picture that Craig put up of the, yeah. the padding. Um, and, and the question from George's mum, I believe, was basically when, when to remove and when to leave. You know, I mean, obviously, some of it is there for protection. If you take too mm-hmm. much off, it gets too, too sensitive. But if it builds up too much, I mean, is it just a simple case of it, you know, trial and error, a bit like the footwear? Um, no, it's when you get that pinpoint bleeding. When you start to get that pinpoint bleeding under the callus, that's where you're going to start getting a deep blister under the callus and bleeding. So you're getting tissue necrosis. When you start to see that, that's when you start to need to remove some of that callus. You don't have to remove all of it, but you just need to remove some of it because. Yeah just to reduce that load. So that's that's the first sign. As soon as I start seeing pinpoint bleeding in the, the callus, that's where I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna remove a little bit. I'm not, you don't remove anything like what you would with a normal person. Um, Cause you still want that, that, that hard tissue there, but just enough just to, to remove some of it. And so it might be that you have to see the person quite regularly if they're building it up very, very quickly. Um, just to remove a little bit, just so they've still got that protection there, but you're not going to get that necrosis that's happening underneath and getting those deep blisters. Mm. You're nodding, Catherine. You agree with that um, statement? Yeah, definitely. Um, Particularly when, um, like Sarah was saying, deep blisters can form because we've got sheer, you know, just the same as our regular calluses, just the sheer... Uh, friction and forces uh, beneath the callus and the regular skin, um, the rubbing can cause that deep blister, which can obviously be hugely problematic. Um, uh, same again with corns. Um, obviously, you want to try and alleviate um, their presence as much as possible um, without causing, you know, big cutouts in the patient's toes and feet, which would be very painful for the next sort of week. And with your soft corns, I tend to use silver nitrate. Yeah. For your soft corns, because you're trying to make you're trying to harden it up. 
you know, mm. if they've got a very soft corn, it's very painful. It's going to be painful for the little moment they have the silver nitrate on, mm. but you really want to seal it up. I did have a dancer once who had a massive dorsal um, blister and she was doing an exam the next day. And if they had come in earlier, like we could have done some preventative stuff, but I pretty much just had to seal that blister. I had to use silver nitrate over the top to give it to give her something hard so it wasn't as tender and as soft so she could actually perform. And actually the dance teacher came in to the clinic with her because they were both so concerned that it was going to perfect her, you know, affect her performance the next day. Mm. So um, that's all I had. All I was like, okay, well, we're just going to have to put this on. It's going to toughen up. It's going to be very painful when I put it on, um, but it's going to get you through that performance tomorrow. And sometimes that's what you're doing. You're just getting them through the next day. Um, it might not be a long-term thing, but in a short-term thing, um, you just have to, to do what you can really just to get them through. Mm. Yeah, I think that's I think it's a really nice gem there for any podiatrists that haven't don't see lots of ballet dancers and they next see one. When it comes to callus removal, don't treat them like your normal patients. Be be a lot more conservative. Um, I think that's uh, I, something that I wouldn't have been aware of. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, have we got time for any any more questions? So do do one know. more and yeah, do one more. Um, and. I know the term hypermobility is a bit of a broad brush, isn't it? And we'll just, we'll just bunch it. We'll just use that term and we'll bunch everyone <laughs> under that umbrella. But I mean, I've, I've long been of the understanding that if you're not hypermobile, then you're really not going to be able to ever really go on to, to achieve much in ballet. Is that a bit of an oversimplification or? Um, yeah, I'd say that, so. that that like um, you can increase your flexibility. Um, I think that people think generally you have to be hypermobile to be a dancer, but you have some dancers who have real issues because of their hypermobility, um, because they're too hypermobile. Um, and so that's where, you know, they have that instability at those end ranges of motion and that's when they get injured. So um, if you have an incredibly hypermobile dancer, you have to do a lot of, lot of strength stuff, a lot of Pilates, a lot of, a lot of resistance training. Yeah, yeah. It's actually it's harder if you're a hyper excessively hypermobile dancer. You actually have to work harder to to prevent yourself from being too flexible and increase it increase your risk of injury. Um, so it's I mean, obviously every dancer you can't really use the Bateman score for any dancer because they're all going to come out hypermobile regardless of whether they actually are generally have hypermobility. Um, so the dance community have been trying to establish a lower um, extremity hypermobility um, score to try and use that with the dancers um, because, yeah, Batemans are all going to come out hypermobile. Um, so, yeah, that is, that is something that we do see. Um, and, yeah, a lot of... So you generally have the same issues with anyone that normally has generalised ligamentous hypermobility. Sort of anyone on that scale, um, you do tend to see... Although some of the kids will have end loss um Daniel syndrome um as well you see that quite common in the dancers just because their family members think oh we'll, we'll get them to do dance because um they're really hypermobile and then you discover that they actually have this condition um so you, it is sometimes recommended to increase the strength around those joints um but it is a it's going to be a long-term thing that they always have to do more conditioning than a standard dancer that doesn't have that hypermobility. They're going to be working more on increasing their mobility, whereas the other ones are going to be working more on that, you know, conditioning and strengthening around those joints. So, yeah, the treatment's different depending on the dancer. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. And what about the lot? We've talked a lot about what, what dancers do right now in the moment to get through the next day to modify their shoes. What about the long term? You're both ex-dancers, clearly. Um, you know, what about I'm the long term? Um, oh, you know. Oh, oh, okay. My dad <laughs> finished at three. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was actually talking to Craig and, and Catherine, actually, but yeah, um, no. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what, uh, what, what, what are the long term? Are there any long term ramifications for people dancing? Is there an increase in, in, you know, degenerative joint disease or, or what, whatever we want to call it? Um, I mean, how are your feet, Catherine? Are they, 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 they looking after you? Are they behaving well? They're, they're okay. They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they could be better, but they're okay. 
Um, I feel I think um, there needs to be a few more longitudinal sort of studies done um, watching dancers and I mean when, when we look at professional dancers we look at them and they're just the sort of the cream of the crop and they're the ones who continue through but what about everybody else so people like me who dropped out at like 18 19 just before you get into those levels um, what happens to all the people who dropped out before that like what's happened to everybody else's feet um, so I think a few more questions need to be asked uh, before we can fully answer that one. Um, I suppose in terms of, of injury to joints and whatnot, um, clearly if you're a, a point dancer or you're an Irish dancer or some sort of Celtic dancer where you're up on your toes quite often, I mean, even the moderns and, and the neoclassicals who um, are up on their demi point all the time, stress to the plantar plates, uh, to the joint capsules, uh, things like that, uh, clearly is something that is probably going to start happening um, just because of the peak pressures that are going through those areas and however often they are um, going, doing their training. Um, clearly they might, they, you, would, you would imagine, you would imagine that it, would, it wouldn't be great for your feet, but um, more, more information, yeah. Okay, okay. So we don't have the data. It's a bit of a bit of a myth. You know, people say, "Oh, you do ballet, you'll definitely get more arthritis in in retired ballet dancers." We don't have the data to support that. Is that um, fair? there is there is some not a huge amount of studies done. So it wasn't a longitudinal study. It was more like they just compared um, older dancers or retired dancers with you know control population, um, and they did find that there was more issues with ankle arthritis and first MPJ arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, those are the two main joints that get stressed the most in your classical dancers. Um, but there hasn't been any sort of long-term, longitudinal studies in dancers. One of the huge things is that you'll start off with maybe 100 pre-point dancers. You might only have 20 left in like 20 years, mm -hmm. um, who are the ones who are still dancing. Um, so it is, it is hard because you do have a lot of people that, just stop dancing because of injury. A lot of people, there, you know, there are career-ending injuries that you never come back from. Um, some of it does happen with surgery. Um, surgery is not advised until, you know, you try and hop, hold off as long as you can because as soon as you've had that surgery, that time off um, affects your performance, affect, affects your fitness, but also you don't biomechanically move the same way as you used to. So you have to sort of retrain your feet again. Um, so yeah, often you try and hold off surgery as long as you can't, as long as you can. Um, yeah. But I, but I guess but the, 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 story, the, the joints that have injured and have the, um, damage, it makes sense with the extreme range of the motion that goes through anyway. Yeah. But I yeah. guess the long-term consequences are no different to other professional sport, whether it's concussion from contact sports, um, cricket years and football, you know, like it's, it's every professional sport has long-term consequences. Mm, just, I assume mm. ballet just has more consequences for the foot, which is what we're yeah. interested in. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think it, it's something that um, is a lot more visual mm. um, to, to, to see compared to, I mean, you're not, not everyone's seeing x-rays of, of the knees or the hips of what it looks like in your professional players that have retired, but mm. it's very visual to see the impact of the foot. And so that's probably why that association with dance and feet being, you know, basically changing the foot morphology and the look of the foot, the, the toes, everything is more, more visual. So I think that's probably why. I think if, if everyone that had head concussions, if their head changed, <laughs> then I'm sure everyone would be like, wow, you know, that sport really screws up your head shape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's just the visual aspect. Yeah. It's just visually the feet look very, very different. Sure. Yeah. So I think that, that's probably a good note to finish. We've gone a little bit over the hour. So look, thanks so much, girls, for getting up so early in the morning. For those yeah. of you who yeah. didn't realise, thank you. Thank you. Sarah, Sarah and Catherine were here at four o'clock their time in the morning, so they were up well before that to get ready. So thanks again, guys, for that. That was just that was great. Um, thank you. Several people, several people have joined late. If you come back in about 10, 15 minutes, Facebook will have the video there. It'll be up on YouTube later today and then uh, the podcast version even later. There were a couple of questions we, we didn't get to, the short, sharp questions. So hopefully Sarah and Catherine can, might pop in and just answer those quickly. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks, Ian. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay.